My good friend Bobby Shuler is coming up next. I hope you'll stay tuned in. You'll be inspired, encouraged. Bobby is a great minister. He pastors a great church in Orange County, the Shepherd's Grove. I hope you'll stop by sometime. He'll help you become everything God's created you to be. You know, if you live in the Orange County area, we'd love to meet you. We have a great church. It's really a community of joy. If you've got kids and you want to teach them the things of God, bring them out to Shepherd's Grove. We'd love to see you. And as always, God loves you and so do we. How are we doing? Good, all right, that's what I like to hear. Good morning, how are you? I just asked that. <laughs> how are you doing and how are you is the same question. We're so glad that you're here today. We believe that if you're the kind of person who says, I find myself thirsty for life, but I don't know how to be satiated, God has a word for you. Stay tuned. You know, if you're watching on television, we from the church just want to say thank you. We're honored that you're watching. And if you ever come down to Orange County, if you're near Disneyland or L.A., come worship with us. We're here at 930 and 1115 every Sunday. Also, you can follow me on Twitter, at Bobby Schuler, hashtag Hour of Power. Love it when you uh, tweet out anything from our program. And uh, I always respond to everyone at least once. All right, church, would you stand with me? We're going to say this confession together. Hold your hands out. Everybody's already doing it. I love it. Hold your hands out as a sign of receiving God's love. Say this with me. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I'm the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Amen. Maybe seated. So when I was in third grade, no, fifth grade, I uh, wanted a Sony Walkman. And the opportunity presented itself to me. There was this guy that came to our school who was essentially, you know, employing children to make money for his chocolate company. <laughs> and uh, he basically brought in this chocolate and he encouraged the students from our school to sell the chocolate in order to raise money to get prices. And as I realized later, I was drumming up like hundreds of dollars for this guy and for my school so I could get a $10 Walkman. <laughs> at any rate, it seemed totally worth it at the time. Maybe some of you feel that way in your jobs. Uh, anyway, so I had this box of chocolate, these mint chocolates, and I was walking around our neighborhood. It was hot outside. We lived in Chatsworth. Uh, and uh, super hot, and I'm walking around with my chocolates, selling chocolate. I'm way far from them, and I get super thirsty. And I just have nothing to drink. I'm so thirsty. I'm going door to door asking people to buy my chocolates to support my church. I get so thirsty, I get the dumb idea that maybe I should eat some of my chocolate. <laughs> so I dig in, and I start eating chocolate, and it doesn't dissolve. It just turns into to brown gunk in my mouth, and now I've just gone from being thirsty to really suffering. So I'm walking around with like chocolate in my mouth, somebody knocks on the door, and I go, hello, would you like to uh, buy some chocolate? There's sweat coming down my face, and I'll never forget this old lady, one time I knocked on the door, she must have seen it on my face, because she didn't even say anything, she left the door open, but she came back with a tall glass of ice water, with a little like bead of water coming down the side, you know, a little frost around the edges, and I just was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> drank the water, and I never forget, when you're that thirsty, nothing is as good as a tall drink of ice cold water. Can I get an amen, people? Amen. There is something about being thirsty and just drinking ice, better than lemonade, it's better than monster drink. And so today, I, I want to begin with that story because I want you to think of a time in which you were just so thirsty. You felt so thirsty, you would have done anything for a glass of water. That is the human condition. Our souls are thirsty. They're thirsty. They need to drink something. There's something in the heart of every human being that is thirsty, that wants to drink. 
You have a desire and you wonder, how can this ever be satiated? Today we're talking about the Psalms of longing. Psalms of longing are the Psalms in which David or one of the psalmists says, Lord, I long for you, I desire you, this this reverberating from the heart that I want God, I need God, and yet an almost desperate heart that can't seem to attain or acquire God in its wanting. In Psalm chapter 63, which was read today, David says, You, God, are my God. Diligently I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole body longs for you in a dry and parched land. You hear the thirst? There's just David's just complete desire is to, to want and to, to, to be with and to experience God to the fullest. David at this time when he's writing the psalm was being chased by his own son. He was king. He was an older guy now. He was well established. And his son Absalom decided he was going to take his father's throne, created an uprising. And now David is an exiled king in the desert of Judah. And this psalm comes out of him where it's like, it's all, you almost hear him just saying, I'm just sick of this. God, I just, I just want you. I just want you. I'm so sick of being thirsty and hungry all the time. Where are you? I need to drink of you. My whole body longs for you. I thirst for my God. As David speaks this way, it's like you almost hear resonating that like there are not enough crowns. There is not enough success in the world to satiate my desire for you, God. I need you, Lord. You feel it just coming through the psalm as he says, my whole body and my soul thirsts for you. It's the idea like when your mouth is filled with chocolate as you're selling chocolates in Chatsworth, you just would do anything for a glass of water, you know. Have you ever felt that way? Especially for you who are believers, you've been in the church a long time and you've been walking and following God diligently and you find yourself in a place where you're going through the rhythms, you do the same rote thing over and over and yet your thirst is not quenched and you say, God, where are you? I'm thirsty for you. Anyone feel that way? You just desire to be just plunged into God's presence and experience him like you used to. God has a word for you today if that's you. In Psalm 42, David echoes another psalm of longing as famous. As the deer pants for streams of water, so does my soul long for you. My soul thirsts for God. And this, this idea that, that the soul is just thirsty for God. And I just want to begin by this. No matter who you are, I know many watching on television, you say, I'm not religious at all. And many of you who are in the church are that way too. Your girlfriend dragged you here today and... I barely have your attention. You're thinking, you know. Some of you are the same way too. You're different. You've grown up in a religious household. And and yet all people share the same thing. All of us are thirsty. And though not all of us know what we're thirsty for, all of us are thirsty for the same thing. We're thirsty for God. It's like every human heart is a vacuum. Think of a vacuum cleaner. Like Think of the ones like when you go to the gas station with just that big nozzle and it's just you know like this is what very often the unsettled hurried desperate heart is like it becomes like a vacuum cleaner that no matter where you go there is this giant sucking sound as you desire to draw just about anything into your life that will appease this thirst that you carry with you Too often when we have this uh, feeling of hunger and thirst in our life, we turn to other things, usually good things, and they become idols. And so we turn to things like even friendships become a way that we try and fill that void. And entertainment becomes a way that we fill that void. And shopping becomes a way to fill that void. Work becomes a way we fill that void. Very often it becomes substance. It becomes sex. It becomes other things that we think, if I get enough of this... We think someday if I get this thing, well then, then it'll be filled. It won't be. Not until you find, and not just find, but experience God to the fullest. You know, 
being in a world like we're in, you have so much available to you. And yet that blessing can very often become your greatest curse. For those of us who are thirsty, very often it's like being on a survival boat in the middle of the ocean. You're surrounded by water, but if you drink any of it, you're going to be even more thirsty. You can't drink salt water. That's the maddening thing about being on a deserted island is you're surrounded by water and yet you can't find any real water to drink. If you drink salt water, you'll dehydrate faster and eventually you'll go crazy. Don't do it. Very much, very much of the time, we who are thirsty find ourselves like people in a life raft who are thirsty surrounded by water. Do you ever feel that way? And maybe you know, I can't drink it, but man, it looks good. When we reach out for these other things to satiate the hunger and the thirst that is the human condition, it's like scratching a mosquito bite. We all know you're not supposed to do it, but when you do it, man, it feels good, doesn't it? When you got that mosquito bite, you know, don't scratch it. It's like willpower. I will not scratch you. And then someday, you know, something happens, somebody hurts our feelings, but that's it. You know, and it blisters and it itches even more. And this is what the human condition is, isn't it? For you who are religious, this is a source of suffering. The fact that you want the things that you know you harm you. You want to go into credit card debt. You want to scream at somebody who cuts you off in traffic. You want to dive back into your addictions. Right? You want to dive back into all of these things. You want to reach out to to flood your life with friendships that normally that would be a good thing but your friends become like an idol to you you're trying to fill your void with even people there are some of you who are even using religious tradition to fill the void and it's still not enough even religion even the bible cannot repl- and i hate saying it but even the bible cannot replace truly experiencing god anything can become an idol, if it is not God, and we need him in our life. Can I get an amen? amen? Psalm 27, then, we ask the question, well, what do I do? I find myself thirsty. I find myself wanting to turn to these things. What do I do? Psalm 27 gives us the answer. It finishes with this word. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. Take heart. The first thing that we have to understand is when you are on the life raft, don't drink the salt water. Wait. Wait for fresh water. It's coming. Very often the process of waiting to experience God is the very thing that helps us grow as individuals. Living in the midst of the hunger and in the midst of the thirst very often is the thing that causes us to grow, to become the kind of people that can be world changers. Winter is an important part of the life of any plant. We don't like winter in America, do we? We want We want summer and fall all the time. We want to be harvesting, harvesting, harvesting. We even do that to our food, and it's a sign of our spiritual place where we decide to use anything we can to make food big, plump, and, you know, harvest all the time. You know, for us, if you want to be healthy, winter, winter is an important part of the life of every plant. It's that famous axiom that Things don't grow on the mountaintop, right? They only grow in the valley. Very, very often the times when we're the most thirsty for God is the time when God is changing us and working in us uh, in, in some of the best ways. We oftentimes don't see it when we're there, but when we look back, we recognize God was doing a work in my life. Friends, if that's where you are, don't drink the salt water. Don't scratch a mosquito bite. Wait. Be patient. I am convinced that impatience is the greatest enemy to happiness in the modern world today. Nobody's willing to wait. Nobody's willing to be patient. Everybody's always in a hurry and you're never present. When you're with family on a beautiful night, you're thinking about work tomorrow. Be present with your family. When you're waiting on whatever it is, we're waiting, we're, we have to move, we're waiting for, we want to move into a house, we want to hear back from it, you know? And I find myself like not being happy because I want to know about my house, right? And this is, this is me too. All of us, we've, we live in this reality of constant hurry and impatience. We want to know what tomorrow holds, but when we arrive at tomorrow, we're, 
We look into the next day. It's like um, there's this deli we go to, and there's a sign on the wall, and it says, free beer tomorrow. <laughs> so every time you go in, you know, it just says, free beer tomorrow. <laughs> and that's how many of our lives are. We're constantly living in, in tomorrow. We're impatient. We get mad at God because he doesn't work like a microwave. He's not a drive through kind of God. Waiting, waiting on the Lord is, and living in the thirst is an important part of growing as a disciple to Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? Sometimes, however, waiting on the Lord does become a rut. And I want to speak to that too. Because in that same line from Psalm 27, he says, wait on the Lord. But after that, he says, be strong, take heart. Be strong and take heart. Take heart means to be like courageous. Take heart means do something brave. And for many of us, the valley, and if you've been there a long time, some of you are saying, Bobby, I've been here a long time. Then I have a word for you. Don't wait anymore. <laughs> Stop waiting. For some of you who your valley has become a rut, it's probably because it's time to do something brave. It's time to, to do something courageous. Many of you have never shared your faith with anyone in your whole life. Many of you have never prayed with a stranger going through difficult times. Can I tell you something? As a believer, there are few things in this world that give me more life than seeing the light of the Holy Spirit come into somebody's eyes. If you want something to bring you out of a rut, share your faith with someone. You're like, oh, no, no, sir. Fine, enjoy the rut. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you that God teaches us, God nurtures us so that we are trained to be world changers. Being a world changer is not comfortable. The Great Commission is not easy. It's a scary thing. Jesus tells his disciples, leave your home, leave your stuff, and go to a distant land. It's going to be very dangerous. You live in a world in which you can be murdered, robbed, and I just want you to go, and I want you to die as a martyr and share your faith. If the first thing you're thinking about when it comes to sharing your faith or praying with a stranger or something like that, if you think to yourself, that would be socially awkward, you're the perfect person to do it because you understand social norms. You'll do it the right way. In fact, the guy that probably doesn't need to do it is like, heck yeah, I'm going out there, I'll pray for everybody, I'm going to witness to everyone. That's the guy that you're like, just, you know what, go on retreat and just chill out for a while. <laughs> it's the person who's like, that's really scary, I don't know what I would say, that would be weird. You're going to be the right person because you, under you understand social norms, but it takes, it still takes courage but you'll do it the right way. I know because ever since I sent out the invitation, next time somebody says they're doing okay, you ask them what's wrong, they tell you what's wrong, you say, can I pray for you? I've had like four of you tell me that you actually did it. I'm proud of you. Good job. And all of them were awesome stories. And you know, all four of those people, it was really hard to say, can I pray for you? Like it was like really hard to say that, right? But friends, we ha if you are in a rut, if you have been in an eternal winter, it's, it's time to do something brave for God. And, and I, I don't mean like, you know, jump off a, cl a cliff or something. That's brave for you. You know, I mean, share your faith with someone. I mean, uh, offer to pray with someone who's suffering. I mean, to give a gift to a neighbor or, or someone who is in need that is that's a scary amount. I mean, doing something that is a big risk and it's not for you, it's for God. I remember um, when I was in high school and I decided after leading the first person ever to faith that it was like an addiction, like telling people about Jesus. It brought me so much life. The thing that was amazing about it was I first started with the sort of like, you know, somewhat popular kids in the school, you know, the, and the nice kids and they just were not interested in my religion. But when I talked to a heroin addict at her school who was in the occult. She loved what I was talking about. And then I realized God's called me to witness to the bad kids. I'm still doing that, by the way. That's you guys. <laughs> That's you guys. 
And I remember like one of the first guys that was really following me was the drug dealer in our school. And he didn't quit dealing drugs when he started following me. He was following me around and talk to me about the Bible. And he's like, hang on one second, I'm going to make a deal. I'll be right back. <laughs> and he'd come, he'd come back. I just kind of lived in that, you know. But I found, I found that when I went to college and I stopped being around the bad kids and I stopped witnessing and sharing my faith that I entered into a winter in my life. And very often, the only way you're going to get out of your rut is if you act in faith. And do something brave for God. Do something brave for God today. Do it right now. Do, do something brave for the Lord. And you will drink of his water again. God honors those who take faith and trust in him and not in themselves. He, he blesses them with his spirit. He blesses them with favor and with his power. Because they're doing his work. Do something brave for the Lord today. Can I get an amen? I was finished with the last story. So... I was living at my house on Palm Street. And I had these two guys that would come to the door. Let's call them Elder Smith and Elder Johnson. And that was the funny thing. They never told me their first names. I even asked them. I was like, what's your first name? You're 18 and you have zits on your face. I'm not going to call you Elder Johnson. He's like, well, you can just call me Elder. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Elder Johnson. You know, didn't mean to hurt your feelings. So these two guys would come to my door. And they would say, hi, we're from the Church of Latter-day Saints. We want to share our faith with you. And I, would, and I would say, oh, that's it. And I always told the same joke. Can I get you a cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine? Because <laughs> they would sit down. It was every time. And so we would sit and we would talk for like an hour and a half. These guys, they just linger, you know. They came in like the short sleeve, button-up shirt with the name tag and the little helmet and everything. And we would sit and talk. And this started happening, Hannah, like what? Once or twice a week almost. These guys had just begun their two-year missionary trip to California. One of them came from Ohio, and I think the other one came from, I don't know, Cincinnati or, or Chicago or something. Anyway, so they would come, and they would sit. And over two years, the three of us became very good friends. And we would debate Mormon theology versus Christian theology back and forth. And we'd, we'd get into all of this stuff. And, and I'd always make the same joke. Can I get you a glass of tea, a cup of coffee, a beer, a glass of wine, something like that? Water's fine, thank you. And uh, by the end of their, their thing, we'd become dear friends. It was two, two years. And we sat down and I said, so, I just have to know. It, what was weird is I started giving them advice on how to convert people better. I know it's like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I was like, you know, wear, wear long white sleeve shirts and then like roll it up. It looks cooler. And get like a skater helmet. Don't wear this. <laughs> so at the end, I said, guys, I, I'm just curious. Um, how many people did you, did you baptize or convert on your two-year mission? They looked at each other and they said, no one. So not one person converted in your two-year mission. They said, no. I said, well, what, what did you do? I said, well, we basically went door to door, and it was really hard. They said people would sick their dogs on them. They said people would slam the door in their face. They said people that claimed to be Christians would cuss them out. They said one guy arrived at the door with a gun. And they said when we're having a really, really rough day, we'd look at each other and we'd say, let's go to Pastor Bobby's house. <laughs> and they would come and they would sit with me for a couple hours and time would go by and I'd like try and encourage them to go to the next house, you know. But they would come to me for encouragement, which was, which was really neat because even though I know they're Mormon and everything, there's something that made me feel good, first of all, that, that they were touched. But this is the thing that I wanted to point out. The question in my mind was, why would the LDS church send their kids on missionary trips. Why would they do that if nobody's converting to faith? You know why? Because they're building the missionaries themselves. Because those two guys, through all of that difficulty, it's scary when somebody pulls a gun on you for sharing your faith to get up the next morning and knock on another door. Let me tell you something. Whether they're right or wrong, they had a conviction for faith. Why? Because they were doing something brave. If you find yourself in a rut, do something brave for God. Or stay in your rut. Do something brave for God. Or stay in your rut. Do something brave for God. Or stay in your rut forever. Because if you don't do something today, 
You'll never do it. Am I right? Doing something brave for God. Doing something brave for God brings life to us. So some of you, especially if you're in ministry, you need to stop and wait. You know who you are. Some of us, we need to wait. We need to live in the thirst. But if you've been thirsty for a long time, it's time to activate the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Would you bow your heads with me? I want to invite everyone who's in this church today and everyone watching on television, if you want to know the Lord, to pray this prayer with me. And even if you're already a believer, pray this prayer with me. Father in heaven, I am thirsty for you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your student. Give me your Holy Spirit. And teach me what it means to, to live your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that you were encouraged when you came today, and, and I hope you leave here finding a way to satiate your thirst for God, that, that you recognize truly that God's life is available to you. It's, it's out there, out those doors, as soon as you go, that you can drink of the living water of Jesus. That's truly my prayer for you today. And so now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord give you his peace and you're coming in and you're going out. And you're lying down and then you're rising up. In your labor and in your leisure. In your laughter and in your tears. Until you come to stand before Jesus on that day in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Behind me is the Y wall. We call it the Y wall because it's why we do what we do. It's letters from people whose lives have been transformed. Recently, Linda wrote for me from part of California and she said, I moved away from my town. I didn't have a church to go to. And now Hour of Power has become my church. And many of you probably feel that way. And she says, because of this, my life has been radically transformed. Yeah, and there are so many letters we get from people just like Linda and for one quarter a month, we can reach one more person with the healing, powerful message of Jesus Christ. Would you pray and consider maybe sponsoring one person, maybe more for $10, but you can do 40 people a month. And as always, remember that God loves you and so do we.